Earlier this week on the 4th of February, uh, lots of folks marked the 108th birthday of Rosa Parks. She was born in uh, 1913 and uh, is known to us, of course, as the, um, the woman who sparked the Montgomery bus boycott. One of the key shifts um, or, or key ac actions that shifted uh, what we know as the civil rights movement. But Rosa Parks uh, is often portrayed or made visible to us as um, a rather meek, um, though strong woman, uh, older, and often the way her story in terms of, of being arrested for refusing to stand up uh, and give her seat to a white man at the end of the workday is framed primarily as, you know, she was tired. Um, but that is not at all how Rosa Parks understood herself and not at all how people who knew her and were paying attention to her and really got her um, viewed her either. In fact, um, Rosa Parks said of herself uh, that she had a life history of being rebellious. And of course, um, you know, uh, her rebellion is not one of the things we often, we often highlight in her history. And when we miss that, we miss a, a key understanding of what motivated her and, and um, who she was and how she contributed to the work of justice in her time. We domesticate her in, we often, or many people often domesticate Jesus in exactly the same way. But his disciples, people who know him, people who get him, ought to be paying attention in ways that deepen our understanding and that offer us a different view of who Jesus was and really what he was doing and what he was about in his ministry. We see an opportunity to do that in the text that Alan just read for us this morning from um, the Good News According to Mark. Uh, this first of the uh, four synoptic gospels in terms of when it was written, uh, it's second in the big book, uh, but, but first uh, in, in birth order. Uh, Mark, uh, very early in Jesus' ministry, heals a leper who comes to him, who approaches Jesus and um, insists that he could be made clean if only Jesus desired to do so. An important thing to note about the word clean that gets repeated in this text that you just heard um, is that this is not uh, a word that only um, addresses the need to be healed, to be made well. Um, the word isn't, you know, make me not sick. The word is cleanse, and there's a ritual aspect to that. There's, there's a sense of, of being cleansed um, in terms of being able to interact and be present in the community. Because of course, the leper wasn't just ill, he was unclean according um, to the culture that he lived in. And um, leprosy would not have been a specific um, diagnosis. It, it was a, a word that could have referenced a host of uh, skin diseases and ailments. Uh, but what was universal about them is that they rendered a person unclean. And to be unclean was to live in isolation and to live separately from the rest of your community. Um, you know, o o lepers were the OG of social distancing. So if you think that it's been hard in the last year, and it has, uh, to be socially distant and, and to have removed yourself from um, uh, public situations and, and interactions with people, um, just imagine what it would be like to uh, live under uh, the Jewish law as someone designated a leper. So in Leviticus, the law is 
very um, precise and explicit about what a person with leprosy has to do. Um, the person who has the leprous disease shall wear torn clothes and let the hair of his head be disheveled. All right, so you gotta, you gotta look like you don't feel good. You gotta, you gotta look displaced. You gotta look out of order, right? Hair all messed up and torn clothes. Just gotta look rotten um, as a visual symbol uh, that uh, people should not want anything to do with you. But that's not enough. You have to, it says cover your upper lip, but what they're doing is you know, they're talking about making your, um, your voice be heard, amplifying your voice as you cry out everywhere you go, um, uh, unclean, unclean. You gotta like warn people they want nothing to do with you from a distance. Um, and then you also are required to live alone outside the camp, to live alone with your dwelling outside the camp, to live alone separate from the rest of your people. Um, and you know, that, 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 that's social distancing at a, at a whole nother level. And, and I, I think maybe you and I have insight in, into what and how painful and difficult and challenging that that is for this man who approaches Jesus um, after the last almost year. I, I have a friend who said to me the other day that they have not touched another person since early March. They live alone. Uh, they they lost their job. So they only go out um, for, for food. And they, they have not shaken hands with or hugged or uh, touched another person since March. And just how strange and mind boggling that is. And many of you are going to have similar kinds of experiences. And so um, we can bring that insight into just how lonely and isolated um, this, this man is who approaches Jesus and asks not only to not be ill, but to be made whole and well and to be brought back into the fellowship of the community. Right? So that's what he's asking. He's not just, I don't wanna be sick. He's, I, I wanna belong and I wanna have a place and I wanna be welcomed. Um, and I want not to be alone because to be unclean is, is to live this lonely and isolated life, um, to be outside of the circle of uh, fellowship. It's not surprising that Jesus is moved by this interaction. The question is, um, how is Jesus moved? Now that uh, the translation that, that Alan read for us this morning says Jesus was moved with pity, which makes a lot of sense, but there is a discrepancy in early manuscripts. So some early manuscripts uh, that we have, of course, we don't have any, you know, we don't have any originals. So these are, these are generations of manuscripts later. Um, uh, some of them say Jesus was moved um, with pity, uh, but some of them say Jesus was moved to anger. And there's lots and lots of theories about why that might be. Um, and, and one theory is uh, the, the, maybe the original text said anger and some copy is somewhere went, well, that doesn't make any sense, but I mean, this must be wrong and fixed it. Um, uh, and, and some people suggest that, that pity obviously makes more sense. And so that's more likely to be um, the, the uh, oldest um, uh, and, and more original of the options for that text. Uh, but regardless, we have a choice here to think about um, how Jesus was moved and, and what emotion he felt and what he was responding to when he chose, when he says, I do choose to make you clean. Um, you are clean. Uh, so, so, so what do, do you think um, Jesus felt as he faced this man who had approached him already breaking the law? 
right? Already um, uh, doing that which he should not do. He did not approach Jesus and say, I'm clean, I'm clean, stay 10 feet away from me. Um, he approached Jesus and interacted with him as, uh, as if that was okay. And of course, according to the law and custom of time, it wasn't. How would you feel if you were approached in such a manner, right? How, how, what, what, what would you feel? Do you think um, you'd be moved to pity or do you think you'd be moved to anger? What I wanna suggest uh, this morning is as I've been thinking about this text is those are partners in the work uh, of discipleship and the work of justice and the work of mercy. That, that anger and pity are both required and both helpful and, and perhaps both even necessary. That if we look at a, a, a really awful and painful and unjust situation in the face, um, we, we ought to be moved to pity, but, but we also ought to feel a measure of anger about the circumstances that a person is unjustly forced uh, to live in. And um, if we uh, look in the face of an unjust uh, circumstance and see the consequences for a person, we ought to be angry about that situation. And that anger also ought to inform um, our compassion and our pity. And our, and our understanding. And that, that one or the other is actually an incomplete response. That if we're really going to participate in, in, in this ongoing and unfolding work of the kingdom, that, that we need uh, to find reservoirs of both compassion and pity and anger at injustice for uh, this to actually work and happen that both ought to inform um, how we respond. Now, it's, it's in his response here uh, that perhaps was born both out of anger and pity, uh, where Jesus really uh, leans into that uh, a life uh, of, of, uh, with a history of rebellion, um, uh, like Rosa Parks, right? Where Jesus really, really leans into that whole the rebel Jesus thing because um, Jesus does not do the thing he ought to do, which is run uh, the other direction from this person, moved by uh, the circumstances, moved to anger or to compassion, moved uh, with frustration at this man's circumstance or, or moved with pity at the, the situation he finds himself in. Uh, Jesus doesn't do what Jesus is supposed to do, which is remove himself. Jesus touches him. And in touching uh, this, uh, this unclean man, Jesus declares that the man is, is clean. Okay, so there's a couple of things happening here that we cannot miss. One is um, if you touch an unclean person, you don't make them clean, they make you unclean. A touch rendered between one unclean person and one clean person does not make them both clean. It makes them both unclean. And if that's not enough, Jesus is not only claiming that that the man is now unclean because the man is now clean because Jesus touched him, as opposed to being like, oh, Jesus, like I'm unclean now. Jesus didn't have the power to declare the, the man clean. That power to adjudicate clean or unclean was reserved exclusively for the temple priests. And let me assure you that they were uh, very territorial about their right and their authority to be the ones who get to adjudicate this, right? Um, so th they, they were not going to be fans of the, the, some the person that they just perceived to be some random guy wandering around teaching and healing. They were not going to be fans of uh, him declaring uh, 
that this man was unclean. They, they wouldn't have cared so much, but the healing, lots of people were going around healing. Um, if you can heal somebody and then they come to you and then allow them to exercise their power and their authority, then that's fine. But Jesus really went up against the powers that be in this moment in ways that we miss if we think this is just about being um, uh, sick and then made well. Because what Jesus is declaring here is not only that this, this man was sick and is now well, but further declaring that this man was unclean and is now clean and therefore welcomed um, to come into the community, made, uh, made welcome, given a place in the gathered people, given a place in their collective um, life together. Mark goes hard for the fact that that Jesus touches this man and in doing so really pushes up against the system of uh, that is unjust and, and that excludes this man from a real and a full life. We should not miss that in his anger or pity, uh, Jesus sub pushes against an unjust system and, and really makes an effort here to subvert the authority that keeps this man in an unjust situation. Pushes up against um, the fact that this is just how the, you know, things are. And you got to work within the system. Jesus declares early on in his ministry um, that it's uh, not just interested in, you know, kind of working within the confines of the system, but pushes up against the system to achieve um, a, a just uh, solution to this man's circumstances. And that ought to inform who and how we want to be when we look at our world. When we think about the liberation um, from bondage that needs to happen in our time. When we consider, um, you know, who the people uh, in particular in this moment are who uh, live on the margins, who we, who we push outside uh, of, of what is comfortable for us. Um, you know, we, one of the things that's real clear um, in all of Jesus' ministry is that uh, people for whom the status quo is working will rarely find a reason on their own to, to change uh, their circumstances and, and to change the system. Um, in order to not uh, have to feel both anger or pity at the circumstances other people find themselves in, the solution is to make other people invisible, to push them to the margins, to push people for whom the status quo isn't working to the side so we don't have to be confronted by the injustice of their circumstances. And so who are those people that in this moment we are pushing to the side so, so we don't have to confront the injustices if we're one of the people for, for whom the status quo is, is, is working or at least kind of working, like could be worse. So maybe we don't want to mess with things. Um, of course, that leaves all kinds of people outside the circle. Um, I'm thinking in particular uh, of folks um, who have sort of been left behind in, in a lot of uh, the way the world has changed in the in the last almost year, um, you know, people who we've declared essential workers, but somehow at the same time have also made invisible, um, you know, uh, the ways in which um, people uh, endangered uh, because of their need to work, um, uh, who you know have not up to this point had access to the vaccine. Um, but but somehow if you if you have money, <laughs> um, you, uh, you are more likely to find a workaround and have access to the vaccine. There's all kinds of ways that if we were to actually look at the 
you know, context in which we live. We would find reasons to be um, uh, compassionate or reasons to be angry uh, about the injustices that so many people live with. But it's easier not to look those in the face. Uh, to, to remove ourselves um, and more easily to remove folks who would make us uncomfortable from our view. Um, and then we can, we can go on as we like because um, that sort of works for us. But in this story with Jesus as Jesus' disciples, we remembered that we're supposed to actually look these things in the face and counter them perceive them, receive folks who others would make invisible, who others would demand live outside the boundaries of the camp. Um, and to intertwine our lives with theirs. The worry is right that when we do that, we might make ourselves unclean, right? If, if we upend things, then we might have to give up the, the ways um, that the system works for us, uh, which is not unlike someone being afraid, someone clean being afraid to touch someone who's unclean because then they'd both be unclean. But Jesus upends those expectations and, and gives us reason to believe that we'd all do better if we were together. All in the same circle, all in the same fellowship. Frederick Buechner puts it like this, compassion is the sometimes fatal capacity for feeling what it is like to live inside somebody else's skin. It's the knowledge that there can never really be any peace and joy for me until there's peace and joy finally for you too. Who and what do you and I need to face that we might think our joy and our wholeness and our welcome might be made fuller by welcoming everyone into the circle of camp. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.